I remember when I was a young lad, and I first got my sword. It was only a wooden one, I admit, but what a blade it was. With it I slew dragons, I rescued princes from their towers, and I led wild adventures. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and we're going to be talking about building a fighter. Uh, a fighter, that's what we're going to be talking about. It's a fighter, it's worth saying again, a fighter. But we're not doing mechanics. There's no mechanics here in this video or in any of this series, by the way. None of that whatsoever. We are looking at creating a fighter from the perspective of why your character would want to be a fighter in the first place. Because frequently I see players who make mechanical builds and then put a name on them and say, here's my fighter. No, there's your collection of statistics that has no personality, nothing thought out about it. It has about as much dimension as a wet fish in a paper bag on a two-dimensional plane that the Orville is traveling through. Did you get that? And I don't like them. On the other hand, players who create these intricate characters who are motivated by these reasons that I'm going to be talking about and then apply mechanics on top of that to sustain that character, those characters generally have a longer shelf life because there's more to them. There's more to unpack. There's more to understand. There's more to explore during the role playing than simply rolling numbers. So that's the premise of this entire series. If you like that premise, hit that like button. It's the only way, folks. That is the only way that we know that you want to see more of these videos. That like button is absolutely critical. So I'm asking you to do me a favor, hit that like button. There we go. I won't say anything more about it, at least not for now. Okay, so where do we start with our character? Well, if you've watched this channel over the past 60,000 years, you will know that we start with... The very first step that we must always endeavor is to have a name. Without a name, we do not know who we are, we do not know what our purpose is, and we have nothing to rally behind. If you have no name, how can you defend yourself? How can you define yourself? How do you even know what you want if you have no name? The very first act that we do whenever we find something is to give it a name. So best you start there. Rightly so. And so... I'm not going to go into the minutia of creating a name or the importance of creating a name. There is a video that I have done on that, link down below, so you can go and watch that video. Now, once we have got the name, the name, as you will discover in that video, is going to give us a lot of information. If it is a strong name, or if it's a weak name, if it is a uh, in, empowering name, or if it is a disempowering name. All of the tropes about names and all of those wonderful things that we have, we can now add to our character. This is straightforward. It gives us a starting point. And so from here, we then go into a very brief backstory. Uh, uh, uh. We go into a very brief backstory. I'm not going to let him talk forever because this video doesn't need to be 5,000 years long. So into a very brief video, uh, brief video, into a very brief backstory. And I've done videos on backstories as well. Five questions gives us some wonderful, wonderful answers. And those backstories are going to give us some direction for the actual questions that we need to get to. I know I'm going quickly through all of this, folks, but it's because this stuff is stuff that we should have done before we even got to the section that I actually want to talk about. So links down below. Lots of videos, lots of homework today, but I, it's all so exciting and so wonderful. Right. So, uh, yes. OK. Right. Backstory. We put in the backstory. And then we plug in the species, or the race, or the heritage, or whatever you want to call it, whatever your system calls it. What is the, 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 the framework of bone and flesh? Where did that come from? And how is that going to, to impact the character? Now, these are the, the foundations that we need to lay before we can actually start asking questions about a fighter because all of that previous stuff could lead us in any specific direction and here's a spoiler every single class has gone through the same process this first three kind of steps name background and species that's 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 the basic three steps those are the fundamentals because those are now our canvases upon which we can now start to ask the relevant questions and this is where you get to talk the first question we should accurately ask ourselves is why does our fighter fight? What compels them? What motivates them? 
there are, in my opinion, a couple of things that we can talk about when we talk about why are they forced to fight. Is it for survival? Did they have to fight for survival? Look at that backstory. Were they growing up rough on the streets? Were they slaves in a gladiatorial pit? They were forced to survive. Perhaps it was an idyllic existence that they were in, a paradise, where they weren't fighting other people. They were fighting animals for food and for that kind of survival. Is it that kind of, if that, is that the reason why they fight? Is it because it's a sport? We have sports fighting. We've had sports fighting since the invention of humans, as a matter of fact. Boxing and wrestling and all those kinds of wonderful things, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, we've had those for a long time. Some people enjoy physically overpowering opponents or being quick and clever and understanding how to defeat their opponents, even if their opponents are significantly larger than they are. So is it a sport? Perhaps that's why they fight. Could it be something cultural? Perhaps there's this ideology within the culture. The Spartans are a classic, classic, classic tropey example that we can refer to time and time and time and time again. Are they there in a culture that says we must fight? We must have manly attributes. We must do this. We must do that. An interesting little side note is the Japanese culture currently is the exact opposite. The men are not encouraged to be physically terrifying, to be dominant, to be very, very masculine. That's seen as being very brutish and very, very offensive uh, to the current general cultural that pervades throughout Japan at the moment. Theirs is the exact opposite, as a matter of fact. So is it a cultural imperative to fight or is it something psychological? Now, psychological is a whole different ballgame altogether, but is it something that the character is compelled to do because maybe they go into a rage, they are easily triggered, they had some kind of thing going on in their past that just causes them to go into a rage? Perhaps their brother was beaten up by bullies and that triggered them into always protecting the weak and they can't actually help themselves. They are compulsive impulsive heroes, which is something that we see frequently in superhero stories. Oh, I had a tragedy, so now I'm going to go and stop everybody else from having a tragedy. It's not because I actually believe in a sense of justice or of this or of that. It's because I mentally need to do this. So when you look at those different examples, you go, all right, well, how is, again, how is this flavoring the character? How is this building the character? Well, if it is a survivalist trait, there are some things that are going to change later on in the video based on the fact that they're doing this out of necessity rather than out of the love of it, which is for sporting events or cultural imperative or some kind of mental if, um, affliction. Think about those different categories and choose one which applies to your character and which is the most interesting for you. And we're going to store that information because we now go to the next piece... It is the mark of a great warrior as to how they comport themselves within battle. What is their technique? What is their approach? These things can become as legendary as the individual themselves. It is therefore imperative that we understand how they fight. As you can see, this is going to have a very big impact on the mechanics that you are choosing from the role-playing system that you're going to be playing. But at the same time, this should now tie back to why the character fights. So let's go through them. Offensive fighting styles. These are people who just charge in, berserkers, ragers, uh, people who are not afraid to go into combat, that kind of thing. A survivalist might be an offensive character. You don't lay a trap for the animal that you are hunting. You just go hunt the animal. You hunt it with brute strength. You hunt it with direct force. You are an offensive hunter. Defense, of course, is the opposite. I fight to defend myself, and I will debilitate you, but primarily I'm fighting to defend myself, or I'm fighting to defend my allies. So Greek warriors, for example, had more of a defensive fighting style, the same as the Romans, defensive. We form a line, we protect each other, and when we attack slowly, as opposed to the barbarians, to use that general term, that were counterattacking in much more of an offensive way. 
very different way of styling these things. It also means that during combat, you describe your character's actions in a very different way. I waylay into the combat and I just smash and hack and just try and intimidate the enemy as much as I can. As opposed to, I stand back, I assess the enemy, and I protect myself and my allies with my shields. I try and adopt a position that's most defensible for me. Look at that sudden change in the different styles. So that's defensive. We then have survivalist. I don't care how I fight. I am a survivor. My survival background was I survived on the streets. And I will fight using any method necessary, whether that is a broken bottle, my boot, my teeth, claws, whatever it is. I'm not being defensive. I'm not being offensive. I'm just trying to make the other person stop whatever it is that they're doing. Very different. Very different. I hope you see that. Once we've gone through that, we then get the specialist. This is someone who likes to be, uh, who likes to fight. They fight for a reason. It could be cultural. That could be an assassin. I fight as an assassin because I need to. Now, I'm talking more of the Assassin's Creed style assassin, uh, the computer game Assassin's Creed, where there is some assassination going on, but there's also combat that happens. This is not the Hollywood assassin who fires from a distance and then disappears and has to be caught later on. This is a specialist, so it could be an assassin, it could be an archer, it could be someone who likes to use a specific type of weapon or a specific fighting style. And those fighting styles might be combinations of offensive and defensive, but they are very unique. The masters of martial arts, for example, neither of them would be described as offensive or defensive or survivalist, but they would be described as very, very, very much a specialist sport. Fences, people who fight with a rapier, for example, and it's much more about the form. Again, very different kinds of descriptions and things you're going to be using for your characters during combat and out of combat as well. And then finally, you have the pacifist. This is someone who does not fight to defend themselves. It is not someone who fights to be offensive. It is someone who fights to stop the fight in the most peaceful and simplest way they can. It's very niche. It's very, very, very small. And this comes with a big caveat. If you are playing a pacifist and your party is it, it needs to do something horrific or the party just likes to slaughter everyone and your pacifist is coming along saying, we have defeated them, we should let them go, we should turn and and um, give them a second opportunity, etc., etc., that can become quite counterparty productive the party can get quite frustrated if they're not allowed to fight considering that most role-playing games involve a significant measure of fighting read the room people so once we've put all of those different approaches to combat together with the just the reason why they had to fight we've got some interesting things there's still more so hold on to your hats because i remember there was a great battle between the forces of good and evil. The outcome of good triumphing was more important than the battle itself. Choosing what kind of outcome your character desires from any given form of conflict will define that character in eternity. Choose it wisely. Isn't that interesting? Isn't, isn't that interesting? Okay, what are they? Let's go through them quickly. Submission, friendship, fear, and death. Those are really the four outcomes that one can have uh, happen, and they are very different from one another. So let's look at the fear and friendship together. If you want the outcome of your combat to be fear, you are trying to create this illusion, or not necessarily an illusion, you are simply a powerful, dangerous enemy. What's the key thing, though, with fear? Fear can only be spread if there is someone to spread it. So if you want to be this giant fearful warrior and you are an offensive warrior and you do it because culturally that's what you were taught to do and you want to spread fear amongst your enemies, if you kill every single enemy, you have not spread fear. You have spread death. 
And that's one of the different categories. So if you want to spread fear, you need people to live. You need people to live to run back to their masters and go, oh, it was horrible. There was a million of them and they beat the poor five of us up, even though we had superior position, weaponry, etc., etc." You want that fear to spread. Friendship is the exact same thing, except it's, well, not fear, it's friendship. It's allies that you're building. So here, you're not going to kill everybody. That's ridiculous. That's not how you make friends. And if it is, um, no, that's not how you make friends. So friendship is going to require you to have survivors. It's going to require you to treat those survivors and treat them like friends. You can't simply beat them up, leave them to bleed out and say, well, we're friends now. It doesn't work like that. No, no. One, one has to be very nice when one is dealing with others. Submission is kind of the opposite of death, because if you submit, you don't get death. It's like death or cake, death or submission. Submission is, quite literally, you want them to surrender. Now, what's the difference between surrender and friendship, or surrender and fear? Surrendering means that they acknowledge that they are never going to be superior to you. We frequently see the surrendering approach in mass-scale combat. The Greeks were famous for it in terms of their little intercity wars that they would have. Literally, Athens would fight against any one of the others. They'd have their big battle. One of them would win and the other one would go, We are not your friends. We're not afraid of you. We're not dead. We are submitting. So for two years, we will pay you tribute. We will give you tribute and that's it. We're not going to try anything necessarily overtly underhanded to try and destabilize this. We submit. So submission is about breaking your opponent and they will never raise a hand again. GMs, here is something that is important for you if you are running a game. If you have the NPCs submit, if they are broken by the player character's actions... Do not have them change in a couple of days where they go, oh, well, now I've got more friends, so now I can counter. That's what happens if, the, uh, if fear has been used. If they are broken, they are broken. It means that they are physically incapable of thinking that they can rise up again unless there is a significant force that is acting in the opposite direction. That's the key thing. So if they go back and they are broken, they don't think that they can win, and their leader goes, no, we can win. Is that a significant force? Mm, if the leader executes one of them and says, you will continue to fight for me because otherwise I will kill all of you. And if you think they are scary, you haven't yet met me. That's a significant event. And so then they can betray. But when those NPCs are in that combat again, they're going to be a little bit nervous. They're going to hold back a little bit and say, yeah, 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 yeah. Our big leader said that he was more powerful than these PCs. Let's actually see what happens. Finally, when we look at death, death, of course, is super simple. You kill everybody and then there's no one left to fight you. If that is your character's goal, if that is their outcome, why is it their outcome that they want everybody to die? Are they so afraid of everybody around them that they want them to die? Is it because they feel that death is more appropriate for them? Is that culturally what they believe should happen? Put everyone to the sword? The Romans certainly didn't have a problem with it on certain occasions. On other occasions, of course, they very much wanted to keep the population alive. But that was just different sort of cultural ideas. The generals didn't really have much choice in the matter. So those are different ways of looking at how we deal with the outcome of the fight. There is still one more thing left to go. Uh, and that is... Over the course of 8,000 years, we have divined weapons of incredible power and destruction. And yet, we are still susceptible to the oldest forms of weaponry available to mankind. The club made out of a branch. The axe made out of a lump of stone. These are still effective weapons to this very day. Weapons make the battle or break it. Choose your weapon with great care, young warrior. It may, it may feel like a, a simple thing. It may feel like, oh, wow, this is just over the top. And the moment I get a magic item that's better than whatever I'm using, I'm going to just adopt that. Sure, that's fine. But think about it from a story perspective, from a narrative perspective. We all say, oh, combat's so boring. Well, what are you as the player doing to make combat more interesting? And by simply selecting a weapon and going, well, I use blunt weapons. What are blunt weapons 
what do they convey? What is the image that we get from a blunt weapon? Well, a blunt weapon is very much a case of this is an incapacitating weapon. This is going to break a bone, if your system allows for that. It's going to bludgeon something into submission. It is maybe a bit of an intimidating weapon, so it could be used for fear. But primarily, I think this is used for submission. This is something you use to beat somebody into submission, as gruesome as that might sound, but that's what weapons were designed for, right? If you then look at the next one, cutting. So something that slices, something that cuts, like a sword, for example. A sword is not a particularly efficient weapon on the battlefield. It's also quite an expensive weapon, which is why swords were limited for very specific uses, especially during the medieval ages. Not everybody had a sword. Swords take a lot of steel or, or whatever metal that is being used to make them. And you have to swing a sword or you have to sort of poke with the sword where it then basically just becomes a spear. But the sword slice, that classic idea of hacking and slashing and parrying and all those kinds of wonderful things, that's more of a finesse weapon. And I don't want you to get confused with Dungeons & Dragons finesse. I know it's not a finesse weapon unless it's a short sword or a rapier or a whatever. It mean, what I mean by finesse is it requires training in order to use a sword effectively. It also requires a bit more space to use a sword more effectively. It's very difficult to fight with a four-foot-long blade if everybody standing next to you is fighting with a four-foot-long blade. You will stab each other unless you have the regimen of the Roman army. And they use short swords anyway, technically, the gladiators. So, um, well, do you get my point? Do you see how suddenly cutting weapons are very different from bludgeoning weapons from blunt weapons now a mace or a morning star or a spear those are piercing weapons those are, are stabbing weapons daggers are stabbing weapons very different very very different it's there is no finesse there's no slice to try and hit an artery or to try and do something this is just a stab a good old-fashioned stab and stabbing is it's definitely not about submission. It's definitely not about friendship. It's definitely not about fear. It is about death. This is about, I am going to stick this into you to replace your organs, and it won't do what your organs do. It will actually stop them from doing what they do. So stabbing weapons are incredibly, incredibly offensive weapons. They're not defensive weapons in the slightest. Another type of weapon is hacking. Now, hacking is very different from slicing, from, from, from that cutting motion that swords have. Hacking are things like axes or pointed uh, flanged maces where it's almost just like a whole bunch of axe heads around a central point. We don't, do not ever consider hacking weapons as defensive or as uh, friendship. They are fear-inducing death machines. They're also utility machines because an axe you can use to cut down a tree, to cut firewood, as well as to cut the head off of your enemy. So hacking weapons sends a very different kind of message to the world in general. Then, of course, we have ranged weapons. These are weapons that you fire from range. So, again, they kind of fall into the piercing category, but they have the additional caveat of from a distance. And there is a very subtle difference. If you are a fighter who likes to fight but from a distance, interesting. Interesting. What does that say? Are you a survivalist? Well, it could be. It could be a skill that you learn surviving. Is it for sport? Well, sure, archery tournaments are still a thing to this very day. Is it cultural? It could be. Perhaps there's a class of people who are designed for long-range attacks. Is it offensive? in terms of you are taking the battle to them. Kinda. Is it defensive? Kinda. It's designed to break a charge. So again, do you look at and see these different things that we can combine together to create very different dynamic characters who are going to approach the battle in very different ways? And we're going to constantly have to remind ourselves, this is my character. But if you have spent this much time investing in your character to build your character up, well, what an absolute pleasure. You'll be able to draw on this at any moment and have lots of dialogue to add in about how you need to maintain your equipment or how you hate killing people or how you just want to kill people or etc, etc, etc. The last type of weapon, by the way, is 
the body. So obviously martial artists, things like that, where you are physically using your body or you are using found objects, a chair, a rope, a this, a that, whatever comes to hand. This is someone who has not had enough time to specialize in weapons or doesn't like using weapons. Using your body is much more defensive. It's much more of a pacifist kind of approach. It's saying, look, I am not armed. I wish you no harm. But if you harm me, I will finish you. But I won't necessarily kill you. I could, but I probably won't. Right? So those are the big things that we need to look at and add to our character sheets. Finally, there are three simple little questions that you need to answer. There is always someone who will have defeated your character at some point in their history, whether it was an instructor or a friend or perhaps an enemy. Someone will have beaten your character. Who was it? How did they do it? More importantly... What does your character feel about that defeat? Is it commonplace? Does it happen regularly? Are they humbled by it? Are they enraged by it? Do they attempt to hide it? Interesting questions that you can ask of your character to get interesting responses from. Finally, you must also decide how they win. Do they brag about it? Do they share it with their companions quietly? Do they reflect upon it? Do they attempt to improve upon it in the next combat that they face? When we complete battles, we should always reflect on what we did right and what we did wrong and seek to improve ourselves. Otherwise, you will never learn. Your enemies will, and your defeat will be inevitable." I think that those questions and their salient answers will give you the final round out that you need for your fighter character. Remember to hit that like button with whatever weapon you so choose, but I would suggest your little mouse pointer or your finger. Anything more could damage the screen and we don't want that to happen, do we? No, we don't. Nonetheless, thank you for watching all the way through until the end of this very long, very informative video. At least I thought it was informative. Now that you have the backstory and the purpose of your fighter, go forth and be mighty. And share in the comments down below the fighter that you have made using all of the steps. It would be interesting to see all the varieties of fighters that we get. Until next time, I wish you happy battling. Oh, and happy gaming.